Amen. Amen. All right. Well, what's happening, guys? It's good to be here with you uh, this morning. Uh, greetings from Hub City Church down in Albany, Oregon. That's the church where I pastor. They, they send their greetings um, and, and also more than greetings, uh, specifically their thanks. Um, so if you guys don't know, Imprint Church has really played a pretty instrumental role in the formation of Hub City Church. You guys have been praying for us. Um, supporting us financially, uh, certainly supporting us with your purple chairs. Uh, so that is fantastic, uh, and, and it means the world. So things are going really good for us. Uh, we're having a good time uh, down in Albany. We've actually now officially outgrown the number of chairs which you guys sent, and, and that's, that's a good problem. Uh, what that means is uh, for people that come late, yeah, thank you, thank you. For people that come late, they have two options. They either have to stand in the back or we have these awful metal folding chairs. And that's what this means. Imprint Church is solely responsible for our punctuality, right? <laughs> because people show up early to fight for like the comfortable purple chairs. It's a beautiful thing. So thank you guys uh, for all of that stuff. Um, like Tom said, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm a church planter. More importantly, uh, I'm a husband and a father. This is a picture of my crew here. So my wife, Carrie, and we've got uh, four kids, my son and three daughters, um, four beautiful kids. Uh, they're beautiful because they look like their mom. Thank God. And uh, anyway, they're, they're good people. So I love my family. Uh, I also love my extended family. Uh, and as Tom mentioned, I'm, I'm related to uh, Kelly and Pastor Darren. And so in classic uh, little brother fashion, uh, I'm just going to tell a bunch of embarrassing stories about them today. That's my plan. Um, you know how in life uh, you tend to remember like first moments, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I don't know, uh, first time you drove a car, maybe first time you rode a bike, first kiss, right? First time you went through the fourth grade or whatever it is. Like, uh, there's a couple of first moments that really have defined for me my uh, relationship with Darren Larson. And uh, so here you go. This is the very first time that I ever met Darren. Uh, interestingly, it was also the first time in my life I ever got a concussion. Okay? Uh, so I'm 11 years old, and my sister's coming back from college, and she's bringing this new boyfriend over. And, uh, and he, like, walks in the door, and I go to tackle him. And all of a sudden, we're wrestling. And he lifts me up over his shoulder. He's, like, channeling a WWF wrestler or whatever. And goes to do some move, right? Drops me on my head, on the concrete floor, uh, and I was out cold. Like, <laughs> it was amazing, right? And so everyone in my family is thinking, like, uh, cool boyfriend, Kelly, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, he... You've got one brother, and he just almost killed him. Like, he's three minutes in the door, and murder almost happened. So, uh, anyway, I don't remember the details uh, very clearly, because my memory's a little fuzzy. Um, anyway, that's my first impression of, of Darren. Uh, in any case, uh, all joking aside, uh, I, I had a professor once, right? And this professor gave me the assignment. He said, you need to make a list um, of the top five people who have been um, spiritually influential uh, in your life. And so that could be authors, it could be theologians, uh, it could be personal mentors, role models, uh, whatever. Um, the reality is uh, both Darren and my sister Kelly uh, made my top five list. Uh, so the truth is that I would not be a pastor today uh, if it wasn't for Darren's influence on my life. And maybe even more substantial than that, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be a follower of Christ today uh, if it weren't for my sister, Kelly. Um, so these people have played a, a huge role in my life. I just want you guys to know, like, they are good, they are godly people. They love the Lord dearly. I know uh, they love you guys uh, more than you know. And, and I just want you to hear, like, I believe you can trust these people. You can, you can follow them as they follow Jesus, and just recognize like, like they are, they're a gift to you guys. Your, your whole leadership team here is a gift to you guys. So anyway, there's that. I don't mean to get too sentimental, but I think that's everything Darren told me to say. Uh, so <laughs> honestly, it is, it is a, uh, a tremendous honor to get to be with you guys this morning, to get to open God's Word with you. And so we're continuing uh, in the teaching series you guys have been working through, through the Old Testament book, of Isaiah. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to chapter 50. 
Uh, if you're not sure where to find Isaiah, uh, it's the part of your Bible where the pages are still stuck together, right? <laughs> because you, you probably haven't ever read through that before. Uh, it's an interesting and complicated book, but it's, it's beautiful. Uh, and, and I'd like to ask you to do this. At, at Hub City Church, uh, every week I, I ask the church to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And so if you're willing, and if you're able, uh, could we stand together just for a moment as I read our text today? Isaiah chapter 50. We're going to read the whole thing. Starting in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? and obeys the voice of his servant. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Let me pray for us. Quickly. Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, we come together um, under your word. And uh, as uh, we engage uh, with this ancient, sacred text this morning, uh, I pray that you would send your spirit to inspire our reading and our understanding of it in the same way that the same spirit inspired uh, the authorship of this thousands of years ago. God, and I pray that as we wrestle with your word this morning, uh, that you would do the good and the deep work of applying it to our hearts and our lives in a way that transforms us. God, this is the truth that we need. It's the truth that we want. And so I pray, God, that you would use this word in our lives uh, for our good and ultimately for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, just snag a seat. Even though these words that we're wrestling with were written like almost three millennia ago, um, they are incredibly, incredibly applicable uh, today. And so this morning what I want to do is, is point out three key ideas from Isaiah chapter 50 that I believe speak into our lives today, and they are as follows. Isaiah will show us, one, uh, a problematic perspective on life, okay? two, a powerful prescription for life, and three, a perfect person who saves our life. Okay, so we got a problematic perspective, a, uh, a powerful prescription, and finally, a perfect person. So this sermon is brought to you by the letter P. Uh, we'll start with point one. Isaiah shows us a problematic perspective on life. Again, uh, if, if you want to look back at, at verses one through three, you guys have spoken several times uh, about the historical context of the book of Isaiah as you've been 
wrestling through. And so what you probably already know is that this book was written during a very troubling and very dark time in the history of Israel. Okay, So the, the reality is that because of Israel's um, constant sin and because of their rebellion, this once uh, great nation's uh, this once great nation has been conquered, and uh, they, they were attacked, uh, defeated, and ultimately deported is what happened. Okay? So they were, they were taken as slaves and then exiled to this nation of Babylon. And as we come to chapter 50 specifically, the text is aimed at them in their time spent in exile. So this text is speaking to this enslaved, suffering people. And things were really bad for them at this time. And and the reality is, things were bad for them, and they were bitter about it. They were bitter, right? Have any of you guys ever been bitter because of life circumstances before? Yeah. Yeah, I think all of us have probably experienced that at some point in time, which means that most of us uh, also know uh, that, that one of the first things that we do when life goes bad like when we're in a season of suffering and bitterness, one of the first things we do is we look for someone to blame, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So my wife and I bought this minivan on Craigslist a couple of months ago. And until Tuesday night, like just five days ago, like until last Tuesday, it, was a, it had been an awesome family car for us, okay? But on Tuesday, we blew a tire, right? And I got bitter, right? It was an unfortunate circumstance. I got bitter. And this is why. I went to go get the spare tire, okay? And and when I opened up the compartment where the spare tire is, guess what there wasn't, right? No spare tire. There was no spare tire. And and there was a tire-shaped cavity, right? Like, no tire in it. Uh, And so now I'm starting to get uh, a, a little bit frustrated. Now, thankfully, amazingly, someone happened to have the same model minivan right next to us and offered me their spare tire, which, how cool is that, right? Like, super, super generous. Um, and so I'm excited, and so I go ahead and I grab the, the scissor jack, and I grab the tire iron, and I go to replace the tire. That's when I discovered that the prior owner had upgraded the wheels on this minivan, and as a result, the tire iron that come with it doesn't fit the lug nuts that have to go with, right? And so now we're out of options, we're compl- and we can't do anything. And so I have to call a tow truck and waited for hours, and when he finally got me to the tire store and dropped me off, uh, the tire store was closed, so I had to walk home, right? I had to walk, I was bitter, right? I was bitter, and I was blaming this dude that sold me the car, right? Uh, I was like, the prior owner should have told me that there was no spare tire, right? That was complaint number one. Complaint number two, what the heck kind of midlife crisis leads someone to put fancy rims on a minivan, right? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? This is entirely unnecessary. Uh, I was so mad. I was so mad. And it was all his fault, right? Except was it? Right? Like, was it, was it really is it possible that maybe, maybe I should have done my due diligence, right? Like maybe I should have inspected the safety equipment of the vehicle that acts as the primary mode of transportation for all of the people that I love most in the world, right? Like, ah, whoops. Maybe, maybe I need to take some ownership here. Maybe actually this was kind of my, my fault. This is my point. Bitter circumstances tend to lead to blaming hearts, right? Bitter circumstances tend to lead to blaming hearts. And and, and that's exactly what's going on here in the hearts of God's people, okay? They're completely blaming God for their suffering and their exile. They believed that God had completely abandoned them. In fact, they use language that's even stronger than abandonment, right? They're suggesting that, God, you have divorced us as a people. You sold us into slavery, like you sold us out. These are big accusations that they're throwing at God, right? And and ultimately, these accusations reveal their problematic perspective, okay? And this is the problematic perspective, that if things are going wrong in life, then it's God's fault. That's what they believe. 
Because our circumstances, clearly God has betrayed us. And so in verses 1 through 3 of the text we read, God is responding to these accusations. And he's responding to these accusations, responding to their problematic perspective uh, with a series of questions that just puts them in their place. It really does. Uh, Essentially, God is saying, you need to change your perspective here, right? Because you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. Look look again at verse 1. We've got it up there on the screen. (laughs) What is God saying here? Right? He's saying, uh, uh, you're saying that I divorced you, right? Then why don't you show me proof? Show me that certificate of divorce that I gave you if, if you think that I uh, divorce you. And, and he goes on to say, or why don't you show me that creditor, right, that I am indebted to. I'm God, by the way. <laughs> you think that I needed to sell you to pay off my debts, right? Show me that creditor. No. You see, God's saying, it was not me that betrayed you, Israel. It was you guys that walked away from me. At the end of that verse, he says, Behold, your iniquities, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. God will go on to say, not, not only was this whole thing not my fault, more than that, and I was pursuing you. I've been pursuing you this whole time, the beginning of verse 2. He says, uh, Why, when I came, Was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer, right? God's saying, I didn't abandon you. I've been coming for you this whole time, longing to restore you to myself, uh, but you've been giving me the cold shoulder, right? You won't pick up the phone when I call. You won't return my text messages. You can't put this on me. This is a dysfunctional, bitter relationship is what we're looking at a dysfunctional and and here's the worst part of it god is totally capable of fixing their circumstances he totally can they could totally have their freedom back all they have to do is listen and they're refusing god goes on to ask in verse 2, he says, Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Right? Am I incapable? It's a, it's a ridiculous question. <laughs> Behold, by my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. What's God pointing to here? He's pointing Israel's eyes back to another time that they had found themselves in slavery. Another time when God miraculously delivered them. You guys remember the story of the Israelites in slavery in Egypt? And what did God do? He dried up the Red Sea so that they could cross over into their freedom. That's what God's causing them to remember here. He's saying, I can deliver you. I can do it. Why won't you let me? You'll only blame me. Here's the deal. Every single one of us is going to go through seasons of suffering in life. That's inevitable. We know that. When we do, when we suffer, uh, we have a choice to make. We can either turn away from God in bitterness and, and, and in blaming, right? or we can choose to turn toward Him in faith. In some sense, our suffering can either serve uh, to make us bitter Or, it can make us holy. Those are the options. And in large part, I would submit to you, it's a matter of perspective. Okay? So here's a question for you to wrestle with. Will you own your brokenness? And will you you allow your trials to turn you toward God and His great love and His grace? Or will you get bitter? Live in denial? That's point one. Say point one, don't, don't adopt this problematic perspective where everything is always God's fault. Okay? That's point one. And so point one is something not to do, right? Uh, which then begs the question, okay, so like that's what we need to not do. What, what, should we, what should we do in life? And that brings us to point number two. Isaiah gives us a powerful prescription for life. Powerful prescription. In verses four through nine here, um, 
uh, what we're coming across is another servant song. You guys have heard uh, Darren, I think Tom, both spoke about the servant songs that show up in the book of Isaiah. This is one of them. And, and it's pretty brilliant right here. Isaiah sets up this picture of the servant uh, in, in radical contrast to the picture of Israel that he had just been depicting in verses 1 through 3. Okay? And so what Isaiah is doing here in the next verses is he's describing, and he's using first person language to do it, he's describing this, this servant, a person who actually listens and lives according to the will and ways of God. Right? A person who actually listens to God and obeys Him, right? Uh, had Israel actually listened and obeyed the Lord, then this is what they would have looked like, okay? And there's multiple pretty inspiring descriptions in this text about this, this servant, right? It, it's a person who, who, who cares deeply for the weary. We see that in verse 4. It's a person who accepts help from the Lord. That's talked about in, in 7 and 9. It's a person who's strong. Right? A person who's unwavering in their obedience to God. It says that their, their face is set like, like flint, right? Flint like the, the, the hardest of stones. They're not turning away, right? They're a person of resolved faith. But there's one description uh, that ties all of those others together. And, and it actually does it with some really interesting language that I want to look at. So in verse 4 here, uh, Isaiah twice uses the phrase, those who are taught. You see that in there? Those who are taught. Now, uh, in our, that's our English translation uh, of a Hebrew word uh, that looks like this, limiud. Okay? Limiud is the word. Now, limiud has a, a whole number of definitions. One uh, who is taught, one who is learn, learned, like one who is, is accustomed to a particular way. Okay? But here's the most common definition, and it's the simplest. It's simply this, disciple. A disciple, right? Let me ask, are any of you guys familiar with that language? A disciple? Yeah. Yeah. Who used that language a lot in the New Testament? Right? Now, Jesus, absolutely. Yeah, this is the language that Jesus used in his own ministry uh, to refer to not only his closest friends and followers, like the 12 disciples that we talk about, but more than that, ultimately to, to describe all Christians. All people who are following Jesus, right? This would be a description of those of you in the room today that have committed your life to following Christ. See, according to Isaiah, what is God's powerful prescription for how we are to live life? We are to live as disciples of God. I just want you to see, like, this isn't simply a New Testament idea, right? This is, like, deeply rooted in the scriptures. So we're called to be a disciple. What does that mean, right? What does that actually look like? Well, according to Isaiah, uh, what's the, the heartbeat of the discipled life? It's all about hearing and obeying the word of God. Okay? I want to look at the text with you again for a moment. Uh, back in verse 4, it says, Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear, right, as a disciple. What's the picture here? It's a, it's a picture of a person who is daily, right? Daily, the, the, daily, this servant of God is lending his ear to the word of the Lord. This is a person with a, a daily discipline of listening to God. Not like every now and then, but regularly, right? Verse 5 says, The Lord God has opened my ear. And I was not rebellious, right? This is a person who's hearing the word of the Lord uh, and, and the word of the Lord has shaped their life so that they're no longer living in sinful rebellion but actually living a life of righteousness. Verse 10 says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? And again, this is a picture of someone hearing God's voice, hearing his word and allowing it to shape their lives. They're actually obeying. Here's my point. Scripture, okay? God's Word plays a paramount role in the life of true disciples. It plays a paramount role in the life of true disciples. We are called to listen to it, right? And to know it, and to learn it, and to follow it, and to, to read it, right? Regularly, and to obey it. Say it this way. True disciples 
allow God's word to shape their lives. Okay? True disciples allow God's word to shape their lives. But here's the problem. The problem is, most of us kind of want the inverse of that. You know what I'm talking about? And like certainly our culture wants the inverse of that. Rather than allowing Scripture to shape our lives, we're constantly trying to allow our lives to shape the Scripture. Do you know what I'm talking about? So when we come to uh, like pieces of the Bible that we don't like, what do we do? Just ignore them. We th- throw them out. Like, ah, uh, that seems so regressive, right? Or that, that, is, that is way too extreme. Like, let's, let's do away with that. Like, surely Jesus didn't really mean love your enemies, right? No, that's, that's too extreme, right? Or, or, or surely we can't be expected to be that generous with our money, like 10% or more? Like, that's a lot. Are you serious? And what about, all the, what about all the stuff about um, stewarding our sexuality, right? And living in purity, right? Like, no way. No way. For many of us, uh, Scripture is, at most, at best, uh, optional advice. Um, it's not a shaping authority. And guys, I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem. Right? It's certainly not discipled living. And um, Isaiah actually speaks exactly to this issue uh, in verses 10 and 11. Effectively, uh, Isaiah is saying here, man, there's, there's two ways to live, okay? So either, either we live uh, as those who fear the Lord, right? Who hear His voice, His word, and, and who walk by His light, trusting in his name and relying on God, or the other option is we walk by the light of our own fire, is how he says it. And in verse 11, he says, Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches you have kindled. This is what you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Ugh. <laughs> That's heavy. The truth is, when we, when, we, when we pick and choose, right? Like, uh, ultimately, we are claiming that we are the authority, right? And Isaiah says we're lighting our own torches. We're creating our own light. And according to Scripture, that will only lead us to one place, uh, which is torment. And that is backed up by the history of these people, right? That is exactly what has happened to Israel. They stopped listening to God's word. They did their own thing and it fell apart. It unraveled. It was torment for them. So let me just ask you, is your life shaped by scripture? Are you regularly making room for for God's word, for input from God's word, right? Or... um, (laughs) Is Sunday morning the only time you ever crack your Bible? For many of us, that's that's probably the case, right? And I don't want you to feel condemned or judged or whatever, but I want you to know, like, let's grow in that. Let's grow in this. (laughs) We're called to be taught ones, right? We're called to be disciples, and yet the reality is probably most of us give substantially more of our time to Facebook or to Netflix or whatever than we do, like, the living Word of God. So find time, my friends, right? Like it'll, it'll change us, it will. It'll change us. God has prescribed uh, his powerful word for our lives to lead us as disciples. And that's point two. Finally, my third observation, I believe that Isaiah 50 points our eyes to the perfect person who saves our life. The perfect person who saves our life. Perhaps with uh, greater specificity and beauty than any of the other Old Testament prophets, Isaiah serves to cast 
uh, the eyes, like, like our eyes and also the eyes of his original audience, uh, uh, forward in time to the coming of the Messiah. This week I got to listen back over uh, several of Darren and Tom's messages over the last months. Um, and, uh, and if you've been paying attention, uh, one thing that, that you will have learned is that this whole book, all of Isaiah, is ultimately pointing us to one person. Right? Jesus. Jesus is who this is about. And this chapter, chapter 50, is no different. So like the last thing that I would want you to walk away um, from today with uh, is this assumption uh, like that if you just simply get it together, right? Like if you, just, if you just get it together, if you just change your unhelpful perspectives and if you would just like read your Bible more and become a better disciple, then you're good to go, right? That's not what I want you to hear. No. No. Now those are great things. And, and I pray you would take them to heart and consider them and, and grow in them. But you also need to recognize that's not the ultimate purpose of this passage. Because this text isn't primarily about us. It's about Him. It's about Jesus. These descriptions are not just about the life that we are called to live. It's about the life that He lived. You see, Jesus is this perfect disciple. The servant song, right? He's the ultimate follower of God. The one who never stopped listening. The one who never stopped obeying God's word. You know, I, I often think like if, if anyone who ever existed that, that doesn't need the power of Scripture in their lives, then it would have been Jesus, right? Wrong. Do you realize he absolutely depended upon the Scriptures for every moment, right? Like in his teachings, if you look at, at all that, it's like 23 different Old Testament books that Jesus directly quotes from in his teaching. The guy lived the scriptures. And not only in his teachings, but think about, think about his trials, right? Like before the Pharisees, think about his temptation in the wilderness. What is he doing? He's constantly quoting from the scriptures. Like if you cut Jesus, he bleeds Bible, right? Not only is he a man of God's word, but all of these other descriptions we talked about. Like he showed compassion for the weary, right? He set his face like flint in unwavering obedience. Even when he, even when he didn't like what God had planned, he was resolved. He stated, yet not my will, but yours be done. Mark chapter 15 uh, describes in disturbing detail um, the abuse that Jesus received uh, when he was arrested and, and on his way to the cross. And it is shocking to read it side by side with verse 6 from this passage, which states, I give my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Mark would use almost those exact words to describe what Jesus went through. And then ultimately, Jesus went to the cross itself. Right? He went to the cross where he didn't just feel abandoned by God, right? Like that's exactly what Israel was whining about, remember? Like you've abandoned us. Like Jesus didn't just feel abandoned by God. He was abandoned by God. And quoting once again from the scriptures that ruled his life in his most desperate hour, he cries out a prayer from Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Guys, this text isn't about us and how great we can become, okay? It's about Jesus and the great thing he would do to make us his own. The truth is, you and I, all of us, uh, exist really in the same uh, desperate state, the same desperate need of salvation that, that Israel 
uh, was experiencing. Now, we aren't sitting in uh, exile and slavery okay, today, but spiritually speaking, uh, Scripture actually makes very clear to us that we are slaves to sin and hopeless to save ourselves. Thankfully, Scripture also makes abundantly clear that we have a Savior who came, who died, and who rose again to free us from this sin and death and to make us new. We have a perfect person who saves our life. We have Jesus. And here's the amazing thing. If you would today confess your need for him, right? Say, Jesus, I need you. If you would confess your need for him as a flawed and sinful person, I need you because I'm broken. And, and if you would place your faith in him to save you, rather than placing your faith in your own really good efforts to save you, he will. He will save you. I want you to know that that's something you can do today. And that's something that we're actually going to take some time to do right now uh, as we respond together to the good news of the gospel um, in worship. And so we're going we're gonna to transition now to a time of, of, of worshipful response and the band's going to make their way back up and, and lead us in singing some more songs. We have the opportunity to pray. If you would like to uh, pray with someone or be prayed for, uh, I think, do we have leaders for prayer today somewhere in the back? Yeah, people who would love to pray with you or you can just pray where you're seated. Uh, we have an opportunity to worship through giving. We have giving baskets up at the table for uh, tithes and offerings. And, and finally, we have the opportunity to worship God uh, by taking communion. Okay, And we've got these communion tables in the front. There's a gluten-free option over here on the left. Uh, and, and you're welcome to come up at any time as we're responding. And we take the, the broken bread and we dip it in the cup. And as we feast, we remember Christ's body, which was broken for us. His blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. We feast the feast of grace. For we have a perfect person who saves us. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, this morning, uh, our hearts are so thankful uh, for your abundant love and abundant grace. God, we're so thankful that in your uh, that in your wisdom and, and, and in your love, you saw fit to save even the likes of us. And you sent your son. Jesus, we're thankful that you came. And Jesus, that you lived the perfect life that we were called to live, but if so, utterly failed to live. Then more than that, you went to the cross uh, where you died the, the, the sinner's death, receiving the punishment that we deserve so that we could be forgiven and renewed and made whole. We're thankful for your gospel. We're thankful for your great love that changes us and shapes us. And I pray now as we respond to that gospel that you would do deep and beautiful work in our hearts, that you would sink that message deeper in and redefine our souls around it. God, you are what we need. You are who we love. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.